Welcome to it, sports fans. Episode 27 from the Bleachers FTB TV podcast. Back again. 12th of February. That's two days away from Valentine's Day. If you're single, I'm terribly sorry. If you're not single, I'm also terribly sorry. Life is suffering. Get over it. Nobody wins the human race. And if you're going to get a Valentine, I'm happy for you. If you're not, I'm happy for you. Anyway, let's get over that. What a weekend of football. A historical win for Man City. And a crushing blow for Chelsea. Possibly eliminating their chances of top four. But definitely denting the stability at the club, if there was any. So we're going to talk about, of course, up front. We're going to lead off with Maurizio Sarri and why I feel now he has to go. And why the situation, in my eyes, is completely different from Jose Mourinho's era. And then why, whether I think uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer should get the full-time job. Of course, everybody pressing for that now. He's gone 11 on the bounce. And then we'll finish off with the rugby, the oval ball. Dwayne Vermeulen coming back into South African rugby. The Bulls signing him. I will give my opinion on his return. Remember, we are on YouTube, Facebook, Podbean, if you've got an Android phone. Otherwise, on iTunes as the FTB TV podcast. And on Facebook from the Bleachers TV. So that's YouTube, Facebook, Podbean is the easiest if you've got an Android phone. Otherwise, if you've got iTunes, iTunes is the way to go. We're going to get straight into it. That's the intro. I'm so glad to be back. Took last week off. Had a little bit of work to do, but have returned from the Bleachers FTB TV podcast returns. Let's get into it. 6 0 this weekend. City did it at home. Chelsea didn't have any men sent off. It was 6 0. I'm going to give you my three reasons why I think the madness and the sadness has to end at Stamford Bridge. Let me put it to you this way. Have you got any friends? Everybody knows this girl or guy who meet people at nightclubs and they're shocked every single time that they're not girlfriend or boyfriend material. Every single time. It's like, I can't believe it. He seemed like such a cool guy when we were smashing our fifth beer and ate Jägermeister. I thought I'd meet my dream wife, boyfriend, husband at the nightclub at 2.30 in the morning. Not saying it doesn't happen. But you're really fishing at the very, very deep end there. You know the kind of people. They'll constantly say things like, I've tried everything, all the good ones are taken. It's like, okay, have you tried going to a cooking class? No. Have you tried to join a hiking club? No. Have you tried going to maybe a painting class? No. So what have you tried, really? They'll tell you, I've tried going to 12 different bars and clubs over the last two years. I can't do any more than that. You know, Einstein described insanity as doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So no, Melanie, going to the 12th dive bar to meet a different chartered accountant isn't trying something new. It's going back to a very dry well. And just because the facade is different, it doesn't mean that you've tried something different. So no, Melanie, you haven't tried something different. Travis or Craig, with their chartered accountant degrees, they all go to these dive bars. You've tried nothing different. You're not kidding anybody. Since Mauricio Sarri arrived, Ross Barkley and Matija Kovacic have been swapped for one another 19 times. Directly. Each player, one for the other. Either Barkley for Kovacic or Kovacic for for Barkley. Against Manchester City at 4-0 down. Bear in mind, they're both deep-lying playmakers. Guess what change Maurizio Sarri made. 4-0 down, keep in mind. He took one defensive midfielder off and put another one. Making it 19 times that he swapped these two players. Listen, I'm going to give you my three reasons why I think 
Maruta, sorry, I said it on the podcast in November already. So I'm merely repeating what I've been saying. It's not in hindsight. He should have gone then. I saw that nothing was going to change up until now. Back then, I said to you, it's because old people don't change. And I saw the chinks in the armor then, and nothing has changed. So I'm going to give you my three reasons as why as to why Maurizio Sarri has to go and he has to go now. Reason number one, Jorginho. Listen, if Sarri's needs were for an immobile, one-touch, deep-lying playmaker, Chelsea already had Cesc Fabregas. You didn't need to spend 50 million on a player who can't pass the ball more than 10 meters. And listen, his hor- he's horrendous without the ball, right? Fabregas is also brilliant at getting into the quarterback position, if we could call it that. You know, in between, dropping into, it's kind of the libero, but just in front of the back four. Fabregas is brilliant at picking up the ball from the back four. And he's brilliant at la- launching those cross uh, crossfield passes either to the striker. You saw he'd formed a relationship with Morata or indeed to Hazard, Willian or Pedro. Those are those 50-yard raking passes. Fabregas could do that. He, he was just as immobile, can't run, deep-lying playmaker, one-touch player, didn't need Jorginho. Kim De Bruyne did exactly what Bournemouth's David Brooks did, right? He found space all day in the pockets between Chelsea's midfield and Chelsea's defence. And while Chelsea had the ball, right, he was all over Jorginho. He was all over Jorginho. And Chelsea had no plan B in transition. They couldn't get the ball from keeper to defence to Hazard. Because that's generally what, what the transition is for Chelsea to Hazard or to Alonso. But now, because Jorginho doesn't have the athleticism to get away from De Bruyne, De Bruyne destroyed that. Chelsea didn't have plan B. That was very, very clear for everyone to see. Listen, Bournemouth and Brooks beat Chelsea 4-0. And the evidence suggests to me that De Bruyne is slightly better than Brooks. I say that, of course, in jest. Ipso facto, it was going to be 6-0. It's like Bournemouth beat you 4-0 Man City are a slightly better Bournemouth, I'd like to think. And De Bruyne has a slight upgrade on Brooks. What did you expect? I'll say it again. I've said it before. Jorginho's lack of athleticism means Chelsea in defence is always exposed because when teams break on Chelsea, he can't ever intercept play because he's far too slow to catch up with the break. Right? Every counter-attack versus Chelsea is 2-on-3, Or three on three. Because Jorginho doesn't make up, right? He doesn't make up for this by being a Perlo either. So I I could get it if he was kind of under a Perlo where his range of passing was magnificent, right? And the thing about Andrea Perlo, Cesc Fabregas, Xabi Alonso, Tony Cruz, the real maestros of the deep-lying playmaker role, is they're always available for the ball and not always just in the middle. So Jorginho is always occupying that space in the middle. So you can sit on Jorginho, he's not going to get away from you, and you can press him as high as you like, because he's never going to spin off you. And if he goes deep, you almost don't need to go with him all the way, because he doesn't have the 50, 60 yard pass. So he's not a threat. So De Bruyne can press him as soon as he comes near the halfway line. That's all she wrote. And uh, um, he doesn't go left or right, Jorginho. He can't. He doesn't have the athleticism. And then the worst part is because of the lack of athleticism, he doesn't have the technical ability to maintain possession. So if you can't use your physicality to maintain possession, which is what Makelele used to do, you've got to at least be able to drop deep. But he can't do that. He doesn't have the athleticism to get away from anybody. So Chelsea can't keep the ball for extended periods of time against anybody who presses them. Bournemouth showed this. So, Jorginho can't run, he can't tackle, he can't dictate the midfield tempo, and he's got zero assists. What is he doing there? The problem with him, right, is you can't change being slow and passive. He's not aggressive in the tackle, and he's very, very passive. And he's slow and small. I define him as a Brazilian-Italian Eric Jemba Jemba. He doesn't do anything. 
Get rid of him. It's over. We can already see that. Reason number two. Chelsea are worse now than Conte's team. Listen, now, <clears throat> while Chelsea have the same amount of points, they've scored less goals and conceded more goals after 24 games, 26 games excuse me, than Conte's team losses. Why is that happening? If you concede more goals, at least let that be because you're attacking too much, right? Like There must be a reason for why you're conceding more goals. You, like At least I must be able to... Uh, Chelsea haven't been able to find the balance. They've been too attacking. That's why they're conceding more goals this season. But this attack is more blunt than a more what was called the least, the most defensive team Chelsea has probably ever had. They're more blunt and, and I mean, they were playing uh, under Conte, a genuine 5 for one They're more blunt than that. And worst of all, Alonso and Espiliqueta have gone from being the best wing backs in England a year and a half ago to looking like they've never played football before. And I have to go back to it. Alonso looks lost. He's always open for the switch, right? But Jorginho can't pass the ball more than 10 meters. And once you don't switch it to, to um, Alonso, what, what's happening a lot is Chelsea are losing it in the midfield because Jorginho can't, can't be another option. He doesn't have the athleticism to catch up to Kante or Barkley or Kovacic or whoever the other guy is. So he's never an available option. And Chelsea are losing the ball. And in transition, Alonso is out of place. It makes him look like a poor defender. But that's not it at all. At all. When you've got Conte there, he'll cover that space behind Alonso. And then Alonso can actually, then the whole team can press. Jorginho can't cover for anybody. He can't catch up with the press. We've seen that. It's a problem. They're worse than Conte's team. Third and final reason why Maurizio Sarri has to go is Maurizio Sarri. Listen, the inability of Sarri to adjust tactically has been quite stunning. I said it in November. I said it when the draw to West Ham. West Ham should have beaten Chelsea 4-0 in the real world. At 2-0 after 13 minutes, surely you ask Conte, you go, okay, guys, at 2-0, we can still come back. So Conte must maybe come and sit next to Jorginho and just let the game settle for 15 minutes. You just consolidate at 2-0, the game is still on. Listen, once you could, once you could see at 3-0 that Jorginho... He can't like he can't help in the high press because Man City passed it too quickly to get uh, to get to De Bruyne. You have to adjust. I mean, it was clear for everybody around the world. De Bruyne was running ragged. Jorginho could get nowhere near him, and it was it it was murder. She wrote at four 0 right? Chelsea still didn't do either damage limitation or hell for leather. Like Newcastle did to Arsenal a couple of years ago. You just go for it then. The shape didn't change. They didn't. He didn't move anybody positionally. This is at 4-0. And 4-0 is after 25 minutes, by the way. The tactical aggression didn't change. It all stayed the same. Shape, positional play, tactical aggression. David Luiz, for whatever reason, continues to play. And is clearly too slow for the Premier League now. And he has never been able to position himself. He's never been positionally sound. But he had the athleticism before. Even at his athletic peak, his positioning was a nightmare. Right? He's always had mistakes in him. But he could always recover. Christensen's here now. Play the lad. He was unbelievable under Conte. Under Conte. I don't know why Christensen isn't playing. Christensen's ready. Louise is a nightmare. We saw it again. He's out of position. It was six. Listen, this myth of Louise being the ball playing uh, asset for Chelsea. Rudiger has 54 more passes than Louise this season. They've played the same amount of games, 25 games. The long balls, if anything, everybody goes, oh, what about Louise's long balls? Don't worry about that. You don't need to worry about the, that because if we're if you're saying Surrey balls the game. Just pass the ball to Jorginho. Jorginho should be doing that. Sarri ball is not about the centre-backs. Koulibaly wasn't doing that at Napoli. You don't need... That's not Louise's job. The, Louise's job is to transition the ball quickly through Jorginho. That's it. Defend, lay the ball off, and let Jorginho dictate the game if Jorginho is the guy. 
So this myth that Louise is the ball playing guy is not true. Rudiger is the ball playing guy. He gets the ball more. And then he tends to switch it to either Hazard or Alonso or looks for the pass into the striker's feet. It makes no sense. Surrey ball should, needs to go through Jorginho. Chelsea have not tried either Conte, Kovacic or Barkley at defensive midfield. They haven't tried 4-4-2. They haven't tried 4-4-1-1. They've, they've, they haven't tried a 3-5-2. They've done nothing. It's not working. Jorginho is clearly struggling. He needs help defensively. Right? Try and drop Conte or Kovacic deeper to protect Alonso, protect Luis, protect Azbilicueta. That's not happening. He's picking Jorginho purely on sentiment. It's not working. You need to change it. Don't. What do they say? Pride goeth before the fall. The kid's not working out. He's struggling. Let him develop physically. Maybe he catches up to the pace next season, which I doubt very much. But give him a rest. You've got Kovacic, who's a, who's a Real Madrid defensive midfielder. You've got Conte, who's the second best in the league. Fernandinho's the guy. You've got Ross Barkley, who could very capably play in there. He's, he's a big lad. He's not afraid of the tackle. And he's got a range of passing. All three could do the job that Jorginho supposedly should do. And also, why should Chelsea bother waiting for Surrey Ball? He's not won a title anyway. Winning the League Cup, FA Cup, is meaningless. Chelsea are guaranteed top six. They're guaranteed top six. So what is what is winning, winning that do? Champions League. Winning the league is the first goal. Getting in the Champions League is the second goal. Anything less than winning the league is failure. Get, not getting to the Champions League is travesty. I don't want to hear about the FA Cup. I don't want to hear about the League Cup. It makes no difference. You come sixth, you go to the UEFA, Europa League anyway. Lastly, and most importantly, when things go wrong since the beginning of the season, Sari has not shown he can change. Conte, to his credit, realized that his Formation wasn't going to work. He went 3-4-3. 4-5-1 wasn't working. And his players flourished. Victor Moses, it changed his life. Alonso became a new player. And Hazard went berserk. He went bonkers once it went 4-3-3. You know, in some sense, I respect Mauricio, sorry. In this world, you shouldn't be fired for doing it anyone else's way. right? His way has now proven awful. It's not the talent. The talent's great. There's three or four world-class guys in there at their peak. None of them are like 35. It's not the talent. I admire a man who lives and dies by his own sword. Arrivederci, Marusio. It's been awful. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Roman Abramovich has got to do the right thing. It's over. Man United won again. Let's transition over to that. Oli, 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 they say. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, what a start. Everyone's saying, give him, give him the permanent job. I say, stop it. It's madness. Listen, have you ever had a sports coach in school, all right? who then kind of becomes a student teacher, and then eventually he or she is your geography teacher. Like, be honest, we know how this always ends up, right? The cool student teacher trying to now tell you to be quiet and be disciplined and get your books out, and now he's not Steve anymore. He's Mr. Robbins. Listen, unless he was strict right away as the coach, that transition usually ends in the classic... I hate Steve now. And you know what kids that say I hate a teacher do? They act out. I hate Steve now. He was so awesome when he was our coach. But now he's making us do homework. And we can't talk in his class. I thought he was chilled. <laughs> if Manchester United give Ole Gunnar Solskjaer the full-time job, they'll officially be declaring the following. The United Way is over. That's what they're declaring if Ole Gunnar Solskjaer gets the job. 
Listen, the ugly, the ugliest business in the world, in business, in life, in sport, is winning. And I'll tell you why it's the ugliest business. Because in order for you to win, others have to lose. And that sounds easy enough. Sounds easy enough until you have to do it. Because there are moments when you've got to trample on people in order for them to lose. You've got to get a cold streak in you. Not everybody has has that. It's one in a million. It's one in a million. It takes a special kind of human being and you have to know how to win. Claudio Ranieri is not the rule. Manuel Pellegrini is not the rule. Of the 10 managers who've won the Premier League, only two in Ranieri and Pellegrini have not won multiple league titles or a title in one of Europe's top six leagues before winning a Premier League title. I'll say that again. Of the 10 managers who've won the Premier League, only two in Pellegrini and Ranieri hadn't won multiple league titles, right? Or one of uh, Europe's six top six league titles. What you need to do is stop the Fergie comparisons. All right? I'll tell you why that's that's got a hush down. Because Fergie stopped a 14-year dominance between Celtic and Rangers in Scotland and won the league twice more with Aberdeen. I'll say that again with Aberdeen. Of the seven titles Aberdeen have, Fergie's got three. Add to that, Fergie had three Scottish titles in a row. Scottish Cup titles, all against Celtic and Rangers. And then he added a fourth one. In 1986. Listen, throw in there Scottish League Cup, a European Winners' Cup, and a European Super Cup. Fergie was a ruthless winner well before the strip end sang his name and cherished him. Well before. He didn't become a winner at Man United. Fergie was a cold-blooded winner before the strip end cherished him. Man United's players have now strong-armed three managers out. And if Ed Woodward allows a manager to stay because the players say so, and they don't have to say it out loud, you've heard them using the media. Smiles are back on our face. Everybody's happy now. Man United's board opened Pandora's box if Ole Gunnar Soskia gets the job. Because Pogba's 25, Lingard's 26, Rashford's 21, Shaw's 23, De Gea's 28... These guys are your core for another six or seven years. If they know they can sulk a manager out, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has no hope. If United want to win, they'll have to let Ole Gunnar Solskjaer drop the hammer. And there's no ways he can do that now. How do you do that after being the cool sports teacher? Now it's be quiet, get your homework out, and here's some extra homework. Anybody who doesn't do it, you got detention. These players have shown Pogba, Lingard, Shaw, Ashley Young, De Gea. They will sulk a manager out. Why risk it? Why risk Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who's never won anything? What's the trade-off? Why risk a guy who's never won anything for a bunch of, with a bunch of guys who's shown they will sulk somebody out? And there's no option for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to drop the hammer on this bunch of players from here. They picked him. They are the king makers. And anybody who makes a king can depose a king. Man United must get a figure, right? That will that the players will fear. And someone who can control Pogba and Lingard. I'm telling you, those two are the they can be your blessing or your curse. Those two are becoming brands that are surpassing the dressing room and Manchester United. That's never happened before. I don't care how big David Beckham was. Fergie got rid of Stam. He got rid of Beckham. He got rid of Van Nistelrooy. He got rid of Tevez all at their peak. In his book, he says, once you become bigger than the dressing room, they had to go. The manager has to be the most important person at Man United. I didn't say that. Alex Ferguson said that. Stam, Beckham, Van Nistelrooy, Tevez at their peak. 
on your way, son. United must get somebody who can control Lingard, control Pogba, and make them realize they are not bigger than Man United. If Ole Gunnar Solskjaer gets the job, Man United have given over to player power. And then I tell you what's happened. I'll repeat again. The United way that you keep talking about is officially over. Because now it's the Chelsea, Real Madrid and PSG model. And you've seen what that does. And once that ends, I'm afraid Pogba's around, Lingard's around, Shaw's around for another six or seven years. Man United board, choose wisely. Let's transition and finish off with the oval ball. So I read an article a couple of weeks ago which nearly blew my socks off. Western Province own an administrative mess. And no, I'm not talking about being bailed out twice by Johan Rupert in the last three years. It's not Paul Truer's legal nightmare that they've got um, themselves wrapped up in. Nope. I read an article that Dwayne Vermeulen and said the Stormers were not taking him because they're focusing on young guys. Now, read into that what you will. Things have come out. It seems there's something a little bit more than just the, the, they focus on the youth. But believe what you will. My problem is why were they negotiating with him in the first place? He's finished. He's ancient. He's ancient, slow, and has never had ball skills. So he's lost his physicality and he has no ball skills. That showed me Western Province were about to plunge for an outdated rugby player. Then the real madness started. Dwayne Vermeulen signed for the Bulls. I, I was like, what fresh hell is this now? I thought to myself, what fresh hell is this? The Springboks aren't winning the World Cup. Why block the youngster's spot at the Bulls where you could develop someone? You could develop anyone. It doesn't matter. You've now made sure that a youngster's development for 2023, where everything should be focused. South Africa should. South Africa already have Jean-Luc Dupriere. We've already got Warren Whiteley. All right? For the number eight jersey. That's all. The, Dwayne Vermeulen can't play any other position. He does not have the skills to play on the side of the, the ruck, and he doesn't have. He certainly doesn't have the speed for for the modern day. Although they play Peter Steph Toy, so anybody could play at loose forward. Really, if you've got legs, Peter Steph Toy is a cart horse. But you've got Jean Luc, you've got Warren Whiteley, and why is yesterday's loose forward being welcomed back into South African rugby? Whiteley has captained South Africa's most successful franchise to three Super Rugby finals in a row. You've got a leader. Don't tell me you're bringing him back for leadership. There's plenty of experience in that box setup. You've got, you, you pick that Lions core. They've been to three finals in a row. Don't worry about the leadership. Whiteley's already there. He's your captain. Even if he comes off the bench, You've got Jean-Luc Dupreer, who's an absolute Rolls-Royce and is undoubtedly the best loose forward in South African rugby. It's not close. It's not close. My biggest concern about this Dwayne Vermeulen story, and I said it back in November as well, Rassi Rasmus showed me his hand by bringing all these old guys back. He's in it for the short term. I said he wasn't in the Springbok job for the long term. But what worries me is when a man who will be the director of rugby has such short-term thinking. Rassi Rasmus is putting his own interests of winning a World Cup, which they won't win, but his own record as more important than the longevity of the plan and the strategy for the Springboks for the future. Because if this director of rugby is not focused on 2023, what hope does that give us in terms of strategy moving forward? Why are you picking has-beens? Why are you bringing back an old guy? Loose forward is not a place where South Africa will ever struggle. We export. We export loose forwards in this country. We don't import. 
we've got too many loose forwards. If anything, South Africa's problem is we have too many loose forwards. It's embarrassing. South African rugby showing itself to be amateur again and begging players. Let Dwayne from has been on holiday for three years. It shows he was so far off the pace at the end of year tour. He's no longer international class. It's embarrassing. Springbok rugby sorted out. That's it for episode seven of From the Bleachers TV, FTB TV podcast. Looking forward to being back tomorrow. Plenty to talk about this week, of course. Aspers being written off. Is that right and wrong? And much, much more Super Rugby starts this weekend. I will give my predictions later this week. Thank you very much for joining me. FTB TV podcast available. Please go and give us a rating on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. And then we are from the Bleachers TV on Facebook for today. Thank you very much.